And we're going to welcome all of those who might be visiting later on to this uh, series on the book of Deuteronomy. Vern is here, going to read the scripture passage and welcome you to Coombs United Church, Grace United Church in Coombs, British Columbia. Vern. Reading from Deuteronomy 16, uh, verses 1 to 5, 1 to 4. Passover. Observe the month of Abib and celebrate the Passover of your Lord, of the Lord your God, because in the month of Abib, he brought you out of Egypt by night. Sacrifice as a Passover to the Lord your God, an animal from your flock or herd at the place where the Lord was cho chose as a dwelling for his name. Do not eat it with bread made with yeast. But for seven days eat unleavened bread and bread the bread of affliction because you left Egypt in haste so that all the days of your life you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt. Let no yeast be found in your possession in all your land for seven days. Do not let any of the meat you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain until morning. And then nine to Feast of Weeks. Count off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then celebrate the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord your God has given you. And rejoice before the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. You, your sons and daughters, your servants, men servants and maid servants, the Levites in your towns and the aliens, the fatherless, the widows living among you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and follow carefully these decrees. Feast of Tabernacles. Celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floors and your wine press. Be joyful at your feast. You, your sons and daughters, your men servants and maid servants, and the Levites, the aliens, the fatherless, the widows who live in your towns. For seven days, celebrate the feast of the Lord your God at the place the Lord will choose. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Byrne. You're probably wondering what on earth was God talking about when he's telling them how to have a festival, how to have a party. But there's a reason why they're there. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But, you know, with so many difficult things going on in the world around us, with so many problems that many people face, at different times or extended periods of life, and all of us go through those at different stages in life, uh, God wants us to also, in the midst of good times and bad times, to experience joy and love and laughter and community. And so part of what Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, is getting the people to do is to think about celebrating. You know, we would love to imagine a different kind of world, wouldn't we, around us? And we try to create that in our homes where we love people, where, where we try to create harmony in our communities, work through issues and challenges, take care of the poorest, the most vulnerable. And that's what God wants. You see, God's image of his kingdom coming to earth is this world that's a little bit different from the world around us oftentimes. Uh, but even in the midst of a kind of a difficult world or problems, God still uh, wants to have us experience transformation, wants us to experience joy and love and laughter. Because this is the type of society God dreams of and is working to create through his church and beyond the church. But the process of transforming society is a long, slow process because transformation in society is a very difficult thing to do. But it's the transformation that has to actually reach all the way down to the hearts of people. You see, you can make laws, and the book of Deuteronomy certainly has a lot of laws in it. 
But laws cannot transform a society on its own. What has to happen is people's hearts and lives have to also experience transformation. And that's when God's real work gets done as it's lived out in the wider society. It's this transformation of hearts leading to a new community that is central to what we see God doing in giving the laws in the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I know you don't think of it that way, <laughs> because when we go through and we read those books, there is some history, and we see how the Hebrew people, particularly in the book of Exodus, came out of this terrible oppression of slavery, and how God brought them from that point in their life as a culture and a nation, and brought them to freedom in the desert, and then ultimately to the promised land. But we see it more as kind of rule keeping, as laws that were intended to kind of keep people in place, keep order. Oftentimes people outside of the church see the kind of laws or the rules that we have as oppressive. And sometimes they have been in different churches. We know that from our own personal experiences. But the laws of God were never about a, a kind of a narrow legalistic rule keeping mentality. The laws were actually meant to transform the hearts of the people. That's what they were there. Sure, yes, they were there to also help when there were problems and how to deal with you know, difficult things or disputes. But for the most part, the laws were there to transform hearts and lives. Now, remember, the laws were given to Israel at an ancient time in history when the world around them was very brutal and unjust. Also remember that the laws were given only a few years after the nation had kind of moved out of, of 400 years of oppression and slavery. And we know what that's done to the black people, particularly in the States, but not exclusively down there. 400 years of slavery and repression and oppression creates great dysfunction for succeeding generations. And you can think of the same thing in terms of First Nations people, right? A lot of years of oppression and racialism, racialized kind of judgmental work uh, that kind of defeated people and kept them in a different place than everyone else creates a lot of problems. So all they had known, the Hebrew people, was forced labor, slave drivers, abuse, and so much more. And it's at that point that God calls his people to have soft hearts and to build a totally different society than what they had lived in before. And it's in those desert years, as they headed towards the promised land, that God gave the people this set of laws that were intended to mold them into a different kind of people whose values would reflect God's values and God's character and would create a different society that would be the envy of the world. Last Sunday, we looked at the book of Deuteronomy and some of the laws that were focused on generosity that was to be given particularly to people who were poor, the marginalized widows, orphans, and foreigners. And then in the scripture passage this morning, you heard those same kind of people also raised out that God wants people who were poor or the fatherless, the orphans, the widows to experience joy and to be cared for in the community. In these ancient agriculturally based societies, those marginalized groups, those marginalized people typically had no power whatsoever. And so this passage, as I'm going to parse out a little bit for you today, reveals the heart of God because God identifies with powerless people. God understands what it is to take up the cause of those who have no voice. Jesus was the one who spoke for people who had no voice. God calls us to be people who speak up for those folks, oftentimes who have no voice in the wider society. But today, I also want to focus on the celebrations and some of the national holidays. And there were three major feasts God called people to celebrate. And you heard all of them out of that passage from Deuteronomy 16, the Passover celebration, which we know probably best of all, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, that's when we celebrate Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Tents. Those were the three main times that God said, this is when you need to celebrate. Each feast took place at a different time of year, but the basics were to offer God sacrifices and then to celebrate. So many people think the Old Testament story is it's stern, you know, grumpy old God, you know, sitting up somewhere in heaven trying to just make a nuisance for the people around. But that's not what the scriptures in Deuteronomy show us. 
God calls his people to celebrate and experience joy and freedom and all the blessings that God wants for God's people. And if you don't believe me, just look at Deuteronomy 14. You didn't hear it today, but here's what part of it says. Here's Moses instructs the people to take their tithes. Remember, we were talking about sacrifices and tithes last week. Well, Moses says, okay, on this one particular celebration, get your tithes together because you're going to take them to uh, offer to God. But I want you to exchange them, it says, for silver, for coins, and then buy what you like for the celebration. Buy lamb, buy beef. Now, there's no pork listed here, so that can't be part of your celebrations either, okay? But then it says, and buy wine and other fermented drink, just like sangria that Nancy and, uh, and uh, Larry are going to be enjoying, and then celebrate and rejoice in the presence of the Lord. Now, you are never going to hear a Baptist preacher talking about that passage of scripture because Baptists don't drink, right? Remember that saying, I don't smoke and I don't chew, I don't drink and I don't go with girls that do. That's what Baptists believe. So you'd never hear a Baptist preacher talking about that passage where God instructs the people to take a tithe, their church offering, and go to the liquor store and get a bottle of wine and, and enjoy it and celebrate. Now, God isn't talking about, you know, going overboard and getting drunk. Because we know, obviously, advocating abuse of alcohol has caused a lot of tragedy in our society. That's not what it's about. It's because God is a joyful God. God isn't a stern God looking for people, you know, to zap them when they make a mistake. That's not who God is revealed in Scripture. That certainly is not who Jesus reveals as a God that he loved and worshipped. God is a God of joy. And God knows that the expression of joy is fundamental to our overall health and well-being. We are people created to experience joy. And so God instructs the people, even though they've come out of slavery, where they didn't have a lot of joy and not celebration. And now God says, you've got to celebrate and enjoy all the gifts that I've given you. Is it any wonder that Jesus, when describing the kingdom of God, talked about it as a party or a feast or a banquet? Right? That's what Jesus talks about when he's talking in part about the kingdom of God coming. It's always, well, frequently it's related to food and to celebration and to this wonderful feast where people from every tribe and nation, from all walks of life, slave and free, come and celebrate in the presence of God. It is this United Nations banquet where everyone's invited. This is a God who's not a God who's pointing his finger scolding people saying just watch it or you're going to get zapped you know this is a god who loves to bring joy to people so you heard in that passage of scripture there's three major feasts that the people of god were invited to celebrate and usually it's seven days long right there's sacrifices there's worship but it's pentecostal worship it's not united church typically worship although this is quite a different group than many of the churches i've been in right this is this is joyful expressive worship that loves god and celebrates because god has blessed them with the harvest with abundance with a promised land i hope you've experienced that when you come to church whether it's you know online or in person that you experience this god who loves to bring joy to your life and let's admit it, particularly when we go through crappy times in our lives, tough times, isn't it wonderful when you actually get to laugh once again or to celebrate with friends once again and to experience joy once again? You see, God understands that, yes, there are times when we're going to cry. We're going to go through difficulties, but there will come a point when we'll be able to laugh and experience joy once again. And that's what God wants for us. There's this third area of laws in Deuteronomy talking about relationships. Relationships between different groups, not just the poor and the people around you of your own culture. In Deuteronomy 23, verses 7 and 8, it says, do not hate an Egyptian. Do not hate an Egyptian. And in, in the Semitic, uh, Sem, 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 I can't even pronounce that. Semitic, thank you, honey. Semitic language, 
where they often use the negative forms, we would translate that like Jesus does, love the Egyptian in your midst. Now, these are people who came out of oppression of 400 years of Egyptian oppression on them. And Moses says, God is telling you, you can't hate the Egyptian. In actual fact, you need to love that person. Wow. Well, what about this law? Don't take advantage of a hired person who is poor and needy. Pay them their wages every day before sunset because that person's counting on it. And that's from Deuteronomy 24. This might be the first labor laws that establish rules for hiring people and paying them what they are due. Again, remember the culture around was one of abuse. And if you could take advantage of someone, you did it. But God is saying, no, this is a different society that I'm creating. And you have to be a light to the nations. And so God gives them all of these, what we would consider kind of crazy laws, but they're important to establishing a different kind of world. Now, there's other laws around owning slaves. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky because sometimes we know that in the scriptures, you see that they were seeming to have, they were able to have slaves. So I wanna talk about the context in which the laws were written because God has to start where people are and where they were in this ancient Israel, you know, uh, and the surrounding nations around 1200, before the common era, is they were living in this world that was very unjust. You also have to remember that there are no scriptures yet, right? There's no tablets of stone, really. There's no kind of guidance of God other than this verbal words that come through Moses to the people. So they don't have scriptures to draw on. And the words of Moses um, <clears throat> that, that are found in the book of Deuteronomy and other places are operating in the midst of moral chaos around the nations. So that's the context in which the laws are given. Now, there were many practices in most days that were clearly opposed to God's ideal for the human race, but they were standard practice in the ancient world. So the Old Testament doesn't institute polygamy, divorce, slavery, patriarchy, and so much more that we oftentimes kind of associate with Old Testament passages. Many of the laws prescribed in Deuteronomy began to set this new standard for relationships and began to move the community on this new path towards greater justice, compassion, equity, and joy for all people. For instance, slavery already existed when the Old Testament was written. But in Deuteronomy 15, 12 to, 12 to 15, here's what it says. God's law spoken through Moses sets a time limit of six years to keep a slave. And when a slave is set free, they were instructed, the, the slave owners were instructed to give them gifts to help them start a new life. Until one day, people would see in the light of Genesis 1 and 2 that all people are created equal and that you shouldn't have slaves. But the reality is, do you know how many slaves there are today in the world, they estimate? 28 million slaves. So even though we think we're quite enlightened and we've gone a long way, the reality is there are some societies that are still very archaic and brutal and oppressed people. And we are not part of that. As followers of Jesus, you can't be a part of that. But you see what God does, God starts where the people are. And God brings them along to the point where their hearts are transformed. And they say, now we understand that we have to treat those who are poor, those who are widows, those who are orphans, differently. We have to do better. And that's what God is doing through the book of Deuteronomy. You start to see God is laying a foundation, and Jesus is going to build on that and expand it far wider than the Jewish culture ever could understand. So as God begins to call a community of people to follow God, he started where they were. And just in a similar way, God still meets each of us in the same way. Isn't that true? God meets us where we are in our own lives. God doesn't say you have to be perfect like Barb, Bob, to get into the kingdom of heaven. Right? God doesn't look around for the saints and say, oh, you, you, know, you have to be like this person. God takes you the way you are. And then 
starts to work in your heart and your life and says, ah, you can be an experience transformation as well. And that's what God did through the society, the Jewish people. And that's what God is doing in individual lives and in the societies around us. All of us know that no amount of laws can produce transformed hearts. It's only as we open our hearts up to the love and grace of God and know that God accepts us where we are today. But God wants us to keep moving forward in that transformational process. God doesn't say, you're perfect now, just stay the way you are. God loves you the way you are, but God wants so much more for us. And so that's why God continues to work in our hearts with the power of the Holy Spirit to keep moving us forward in changing our lives and making them more joyful and more spirit-filled so that other people will experience that and we will experience that transformation. As we experience God's love and grace given to us freely, it should result in softer hearts. Hearts that are open, responsive to God's spirit, moving us along in our faith journey so that the laws we strive to live out are, are really only the two that Jesus tells us. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you do that, well, you know you're on the road of transformation. And you know that God will use you to help other people experience joy and love and hope. Amen. Honey, we are going to sing that song now. The song that uh, some of you already knew. We are going to um, sing.